collateral orbitotomy, remove this bone, or when you do a decompression where this gets driven. So it's important to tell a decompression patient one of the side effects of this surgery is a little reduced sensation around the eye. Now, what could be the importance of this suture? This is your greater wing of sphenoid. That's the zygoma. Now, whenever we do, uh, this is a comminuted zygoma fracture. Whenever we do uh, zygoma fracture repair, and obviously, if I go back to the image, uh, zygoma would be involved, the frontozygomatic is involved. This suture intraoperatively is used to align the fracture fragment. So if the suture continuity is aligned, then you know that the fragments have been aligned in a correct manner. So I've just put this picture for you to uh, understand the importance of that suture. Uh, this, of course, was a unique case where we had to actually exteriorize these bones, fix them, and then put it back. But uh, the idea is the same. In any zygoma fracture, these sutures are utilized as indicators during surgery. And the greater wing of sphenoid is definitely used for orbital decompression uh, because this is going to give you, this lies right behind the eye. So when you remove this bone, the eyeball movement is directly axially posterior and you get good correction uh, of proptosis in thyroid patients or in patients. So anyone can tell me any other indication of decompression apart from thyroid? In which other case is the eye prominent? Shai Kumar. Shai Kumar is Jyoti, are you there? Dr. Aditya Rajan. Dr. Aditya Rajan. Hello? Recording in progress. Dr. Aditya? Dr. Seal, are you there? Yeah. So situations like craniosynostosis, where you have less of orbital space, decompression can help for mild to moderate corrections. Sometimes you don't have extra tissue in the orbit, but the eyeball itself could be large, unilateral high myopia. There can be a cosmetic problem because of the pseudo proptosis in these patients. So in all these cases, we target the deep lateral wall, decompress and move the eyeball behind. So, yeah, so when we do lateral orbitotomy, this is the part of the bone that we remove as an access to the orbit. Uh, less and less of lateral orbitotomies are being done now. Uh, in most cases, we are able to just drill the rim and take out the tumors, but this is rarely required as an access. Now, this is the left eye medial wall, and we have already earlier seen the anterior ethmoidal foramen and the posterior ethmoidal foramen. This is the ethmoidal bone. I see if we have, yeah, uh, the legs. So fracture is very common in the thinnest bone, which is the ethmoids. This is your lacrimal bone, and this is your frontal process of uh, maxilla. Now, when we operate these patients uh, for any reason, it could be fracture, it could be decompression, or it could be trying to get out a tumor or just take a biopsy. There are certain basic ways in which you can reach up to the orbit. So there are either transcranial routes, you can go through the cranium. There are transantral routes through the antrum of the maxilla, endonasal routes, and there are transorbital routes. So transorbital is what we as eye doctors or oculoplastic surgeons know, transconjunctival, transcutaneous, uh, transcarenkular. These are all broadly, they come under the transorbital approaches, even the abex one approach. And um, let us talk a little <coughs> about these. So abex is basically trying to reach the lateral wall behind the orbital rib. It's a less popular technique but it has been uh, popularized mainly for lateral wall decompression for patients with thyroid disorders. Ab interno is all your uh, transcutaneous and transconjunctival approaches to various components of the orbit. So we have four surgical spaces of the orbit. Who will enumerate them? 
Anyone? Dr. Anusha. Hello. Yes. It is the uh, subperiosteal space. Right. Then we have the peripheral orbital space or the anterior space. Then uh, we have the central space and the innermost is the subtenant space. Okay. So the, the peripheral and central is also known as extraconal and intraconal space okay so any surgery or any procedure that is performed or any pathology that you see on imaging can be subclassified into occupying one of these surgical spaces sometimes more than one but knowing these surgical spaces is important to simplify the understanding of orbital disorders so let's go to um just move. Yeah. So here I'm just going to go through a decompression video. Now we do these decompressions for thyroid patients and all other non-thyroid causes of uh, a prominent time. So what do we do? Uh, we can either choose an eyelid crease incision, which gives us access to the entire lateral wall, or we can also do what is called as a Berkey sorry. We can also do a canthotomy incision. Yeah, this is the uh, eyelid crease incision. And you can see the highlighted part uh, on the bone here, which we will have access to if we go through the eyelid crease. Through canthotomy, you get only access to the bang lateral part of the uh, orbital, uh, the, the lateral wall, sorry. So here we are going through the eyelid crease, skin, orbicularis, and our first goal is to reach the orbital rim. Then we are cutting the periosteum. We are creating an incision on the periosteum for three to four clock hours, as shown here. And then we start to enter the orbit. So you start reflecting the periosteum to get into the extra periosteal space. That's one of the surgical spaces that you mentioned. So here we are getting into the extraperiosteal space. And here, obviously, the first vessel you're going to encounter is the zygomaticotemporal. temporal. So I think in this video, it gets exposed. Yeah, that's the one which is being cauterized now. So we are just cauterizing that so as to avoid bleeding. So here I'm showing the same thing on a skull to simplify the understanding. Imagine this tape as your periosteum. So you are stripping it off all the way up to the apex because this surgery is being done for um, decompression. So what we are doing here is drilling the anterior half of the lateral wall. So if you, oops, I'm sorry. Yeah, here if you see, this is the initial notch that we create, and then we start drilling the lateral wall. And there will be an inset with a scan which shows what part of the bone that we are drilling. We are not reaching the trigone yet. This is just the anterior part. So if you go full thickness here on the other side, you will have temporalis muscle. And as we go posteriorly, that's the greater wing of sphenoid. That is when we are reaching the trigone and on the opposite side, you have the temporal lobe of the brain. So in the posterior part, we are more careful. We use a diamond bar so that it does not drill very fast. So could Here you please are... tell about the trigone where exactly it is for the benefit of the residents? Just get to the scan. Yeah, so this is the trigone. So if you look at the lateral wall in an axial cut, you will find the zygoma anteriorly and then the greater wing of sphenoid. And um, where the where it meets the temporal bone, that's where you have a trigone. We call it as a trigone because that also has medullary part of the bone. And during drilling, you can really reach up to great depths and you can even go full thickness here, exposing the dura uh, in a controlled manner. So that's the trigone area that we are drilling. 
So this is exactly behind the eye, and that's why this gives you good correction or posterior movement of the uh, eyeball. To reach the floor, we can take skin incisions uh, or conjunctival, but the conjunctival post septal is the most popular. So here we are taking a conjunctival incision on the palpebral side. So this is extending all the way from C to C, that is caruncle to canthus. And once the conjunctiva is cut, we use a Stevens scissors and we spread it just within the orbital rim so that we reach the floor of the orbital. So transconjunctival approach is very quick. It literally takes you to the orbit in less than a minute. And here we are starting to make a small opening in the medial part of the floor, as you can see. It's medial to the neurovascular bundle. This is the neurovascular bundle, and here we are making the opening. This is the right eye that we are viewing. And we'll also see a skull model. So what we are doing is spreading the Stevens scissors just within the orbital rim, then taking an incision on the periorbita then separating the periorbita all the way up to the apex. Then we make an opening somewhere midway because you can't reach all the way to the apex. So you make opening in halfway through, anterior part you punch as is shown in this video. And the posterior part we actually crack <laughs> dip or with a periosteum elevator. So here you can see that our lateral limit of decompression is the neurovascular bundle. We don't go lateral to that. And that's the posterior part of the floor. It's being cracked open by either a periosteum elevator or sometimes we use a suction tape to uh, we use the orbital rim as a fulcrum and we just crack it so that the whole thing comes off. How large is the opening, Milind, we need to make? Because this is directly connected to the maxillary sinus. Correct. So we have to reach all the way up to the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. The, the orbit continues even beyond that because yes. if you remember the uh, orbital plate of palatine bone uh, lies beyond that. So we cannot reach all the way there. But with floor, our limit is the maxilla. So how do we identify that is we put the suction tip into the maxilla and we come all mm. the way up to the uh, posterior wall. And we should expect no uh, ledge of bone between the orbit and the maxilla. You should not be able to make out where orbit is ending and maxilla is beginning. That's an that's a good endpoint to say that you have decompressed the flow right up to the apex, particularly in patients where you are doing it for nerve compression. Uh, nowadays, we also use navigation so that we know exactly where we are, but uh, anatomically. Uh, entering the sinus and coming up is a good clue. Now, this is a transcaruncular, trans sorry. This is the right eye being operated. You can yeah. already see eyelid crease incision. So, this is the transconjunctival approach to the medial wall. If you were to take transcutaneous approach, there is a lynch incision, uh, which can also take you to the medial wall. And I'm just going to continue this uh, video. So here we are taking a transcaruncular incision. It's between the eyelid and the globe, as you can see. And we are splitting the caruncle. So this extends for three to four clock hours above and below the caruncle. And once you have reached the subepithelial component, you again do the same act. You use the Steven scissors, but here instead of a vital rim, you are feeling the posterior lacrimal crest. And sometimes that can be a very big landmark. So here you can see the medial wall is being exposed. Now I'm taking an incision on the periosteum of the medial wall and reflecting it so that we can start the medial wall decompression. So here again, as we studied earlier, the distances, uh, anterior ethmoidal vessel and the posterior ethmoidal vessels. 24 and then 12. So 35 is usually the guideline we keep as safety margin. So we don't want to go more than 35 mm from the anterior lacrimal crest. So you can see the punch again starting the medial wall decompression here. 
So you punch anteriorly up to the posterior lacrimal crease. So here is again a bony simulation. Uh, periosteum is raised. Then you make an opening. Those two red dots are anterior and posterior ethmoidal vessels. So start punching anteriorly up to the posterior lacrimal crest. The blue one is the sac. And this is the inferomedial strut. So you've performed floor decompression. You are now performing medial wall decompression. But in the anterior half, you maintain this bone, which is between these two walls. It's called IOS or inferomedial orbital strut. And you remove the posterior half of the strut. That's what is being done right now. So when we remove the posterior half of the strut, suddenly in the apical area, the medial rectus and the inferior rectus move away. And there is enough space for the nerve to breathe. So this is a very good component of surgery in uh, compressive neuropathy. So we'll go to the other aspects which would mean uh, tumor management. So this is uh, this is this incision is more popular for craniotomies. So this is a bicoronal incision or a coronal incision. But you can also do white <coughs> compressions through a coronal incision. Uh, it's very rarely done, but we had one patient where we uh, did this, and this photograph was taken at that time. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the approaches to the orbit. Now, when you read uh, your textbook, you will always find uh, transcutaneous approaches and transconjunctival approach. That's the that's the textbook way of looking at things uh, so that they describe it chapter wise. So that's the outside in method. When you work as a clinician, you actually think inside out. So what I first see is where is the tumor? If the tumor is well defined, then my plan is to remove it completely. If it is ill defined, then my plan is just to take a biopsy enough to know what it is. And what approach I will choose will depend on where is the optic nerve in relation to this tumor. So whether I'll go super, I'll take the tumor out superolaterally through an eyelid crease incision, or I will pull it out from the inferolateral approach through a transconjunctival incision will depend upon where the nerve is lying. So I just go through that. So what goes in our mind when we plan these surgeries, where exactly is the lesion? whether it's in the anterior orbit or the posterior orbit, whether it's intra or extraconal. Most extraconal tumors are lacrimal gland tumors. And intraconal, there are multiple options and possibilities. And the important question, where is the optic nerve? Because you don't want to cross the optic nerve when you're trying to reach the tumor. Just quick uh, examples. You can see this one is a very anterior lesion. Uh, so we approached transconjunctively, and this turned out to be a circumscribed uh, uh, lymphangioma. Here is a superolateral mass. You can see the eyeball is moved inwards and medially. This was a well-defined lacrimal gland mass, which came out without a lateral orbital rim removal. And this turned out to be pleomorphic adenoma. So this, is, this surgery was performed through an eyelid crease incision. So anyone wants to take this, what type of proptosis is this? Uh, axial, non-axial? Jyoti, are you there? Anyone? Uh, yes, sir. This is a non-axial proptosis where the eyeball has moved in laterally. Correct, yes. So how do you measure that? So you measure it from the midline to the medial limbus. So you either you can make a marking with a pen or you can just eyeball and place a scale and measure this. You can obviously see that this eyeball is moved much way lateral as compared to the uh, uh, left eye. And it's also moved down. If you pass a line through the left pupil, this eyeball is shifted down. So you can place two scales and measure this in millimeters. Uh, especially when you are presenting your case. And the imaging shows that there's a superomedial mass here. So uh, when you have lesions which are anterior in the orbit, you can do transseptal anterior orbitotomy. So in that, what do we do is we take an incision through the lid crease, open the septum, 
So if you look at an ice cream cone, all of you must have eaten an ice cream cone. Before you start eating, there is a small piece of wrapper right on the top of the cone, which you remove and then you start eating the ice cream. Imagine that wrapper to be your uh, septum of the orbit. So anytime you want to start eating the ice cream, you first remove the wrapper. So that is the transeptal approach. So if you take an incision in the septum, uh, what you will see is the preoponeurotic fat. So between the orbital rim on one side and the levator on the other side, you, you are actually entering the anterior part of the orbit. So that is what was done here for this uh, lady whose scans we saw. So that's the lesion that is exposed. We are applying the cryo now. This is a fast forwarded video just to save time. And this was a bilobe lesion. So we removed one component and then we had to again slowly dissect the, the other part. And that's how this whole thing came out. And this turned out to be a cystic schwannoma. So here we are entering the extraconal space of the orbit. That's the other part of the lesion. So that's a transeptal approach. Here is another patient with a superolateral mass. You can see the eyeball is moved inferiorly. And uh, this one was performed through a special incision. Anyone wants to name this incision? Its first alphabet starts with the shape of this incision. Dr. Akhe, are you there? Stellard. Yeah, stellar right incision. Uh, so it starts as a subbrow incision. It's a gentle S shape, and laterally it curves into one of the uh, eyelid creases. Most of the times nowadays we prefer an eyelid crease incision than a subbrow incision. But here there are just examples of uh, patients where we use the stellar right incision, and the subbrow mark can remain. This is something which we rarely do, lateral orbital rim removal. But in select cases, this gives us good access to the intraconal space, uh, good access to large uh, tumors, which may not come out unless you remove this. Thing. This is an apical osteoma. You can see it even has a stalk. And we removed this through an eyelid uh, crease incision. These are the pre and uh, post surgery images. Finally, I'll come uh, to this concept of intraconal pathology. Uh, how do we choose how we operate? We choose the shortest route to get the tumor out and the safest route and also a flexible route where we can change the plan based on whether the tumor is compressible or not. So I'll give you an example. So if, if the optic nerve is inferomedial in relation to this tumor, then we will take the tumor out through a lid crease incision and we will pull it outwards laterally. If the optic nerve is superomedial, then we will pull it inferolaterally through a transconjunctival incision. If the optic nerve is lateral to the tumor, then we will go transcarancular and remove the tumor. So you want to approach the tumor away from the optic nerve so that you don't injure it. That's the idea. And between the post-septal and pre-septal, you can see the uh, it's it's a very anatomically correct name. This is the septum, this line extending from the tarsus to the orbital. So here, our incision as well as approach is entirely behind the septum. That's why it's called post-septal. Here, our incision is just at the inferior border of tarsus. We violated the septum. Then we came to the orbital rib. And then we entered the extraperiosteal space. So this is a little longish incision. It takes a little longer. Plus, because you have disrupted the septum, it can cause mid-lamellar contracture and lower eyelid retraction as a complication. So most of vital surgeons nowadays use post-septal approach. Just one or two uh, examples of patients with proptosis. Uh, this was removed through inferior transconjunctival incision because the optic nerve was uh, infero, uh, sorry, superomedial to it. And this was a cavernous image. 
here uh, the optic nerve was inferomedial. So we took a little crease incision and removed it from the superolateral aspect. So just in short, uh, the areas that we can cover through various incisions, eyelid crease can give you access to roof, lateral wall, transcarancular to the entire medial wall for decompressions for medial extraconal tumors or even intraconal tumors. And the inferior transpending type will give us access to the floor as well as the inferior part of the organ. So these are all your uh, three incisions which will take you to any part of the orbit. So I'll stop here. Uh, any questions, comments from the uh, moderators, uh, from the experts? Let me take them now. A suggestion for the juniors who are present here. You know, we have all heard Dr. Knight presenting before. And apart from the substance of his, you know, talks, what is very vital to understand the way he presents, I think that is an important lesson for all of us, you know, the, pre the precision and, but at the same time, you know, attention to detail. So it's actually best of both worlds. I think for people who are presenting all over, this is something you should take home from today's meeting. Thank you. Any questions from any of the residents? Because you will definitely have a skull in your exam. And you might be asked about uh, an anatomic landmark and the viva will start there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Milan, can you please repeat the uh, what is trigone area and what is the clinical application? Okay, trigon, I can go to that first image. Yeah, this is the trigon. So trigon is more of a, a, a surgical landmark than an anatomic landmark. So obviously uh, trigon, if you look at it theoretically, it lies within the greater wing of Sweden. Uh, because here, this is where the zygoma ends. You can see the suture. So that's zygoma, but this is your greater wing of sphenoid. But trigone is the area where your temporal bone also joins it. So you can see this triangle that is formed. And the same thing will be visible if you look at uh, a CT scan. And uh, the anatomy is going to be the same. Let me show you an axial cut somewhere. Yeah, this is the trigone. <coughs> so what we eyeball, in, particularly in a decompression cases, how big is the trigone? So if I have more bone here, I know that I'll get good correction. And trigones are very thin or practically non-existent in patients who have craniosynostosis because from the brain side, due to raised ICT, already it's thinned out. So uh, based on the size of the trigone, you get a vague idea of how much uh, reduction you're going to get. Just like you look at the lens and you know how hard it is, so how difficult your surgery is going to be. Thank you. So I hope uh, all the residents, they have uh, listened to the whole lecture attentively. And so now, uh, should we ask some questions to the residents? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you should you sure. should ask. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, anyone the first can question tell... I would be asking: What are okay. the number of bones that are involved in yes, the Yes, that's the first question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to flash the clues here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody seven. said. Yeah. Seven. Seven bones. Seven bones. Mm. Okay. Right. Correct. Sir, I have a doubt that body of a sphenoid uh, is a part of medial wall. Body? Body, body of a sphenoid. Uh, not really, because once you reach the posterior ethmoids, you are practically reaching the, uh, the uh, optic canal and the annulus. So, yes, theoretically, if you look at the medial wall, let's go to one of those pictures. 
anatomically? Yes, surgically, no. You don't really venture there. That's the body of your sphere. No, this is the vacuum. I'm sorry. Looking for medial wall picture. Yes, body of the sphere. You don't really uh, go there surgically because even if you want to expose that, it's going to be impossible. You will have the optic nerve converging. You'll have the annulus of Zin and all the extraocular muscles. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So during your external DCR, mm -hmm. where do you give where do you start the ostium? Which suture line do you start the ostium for the residents? Yeah, residents. That has flashed the picture also here. So you can yes. name the suture line. This is the suture. So what are the bones on either side? The lacrimal bone and the maxillary bone. Frontal okay. process of maxilla. Right. So this is frontal process of maxilla. Yes. This is the lacrimal bone. So madam is asking at what suture do you begin your bony work, which is the first punch or the first opening. I ask you, where do you start trenching? You will know quickly. Hmm. So this is the anterior lacrimal crest, right? This is where you start reflecting the periosteum. And you will finally reach this suture. What suture is that? Somebody was telling. No? Yeah. You can, you can name the bones, lacrimal and the maxilla. So it's a lacrimal maxillary suture. And uh, when you retract the periosteum beyond that frontal process of maxilla is thick bone so it will look white in color as soon as you reach the suture and you start exposing the lacrimal bone that bone is so thin that it starts looking blue so talking is happening so you start your periosteum at the junction of the white and the blue bone or in anatomic lang uh, language, the lacrimal mm -hmm. suture. What's your question? Excuse me, someone is, uh, audio is on and they are not talking about the subject. Please turn off your audio. Any other questions for the residents or from the residents? Look at the chat box. I hope all have remembered the position of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramens. What is the distance from the posterior lacrimal crest? And what is that rule called? It's a it's a favorite question from the examiners. So it is the rule of half. Right. 24, 12, and 6 uh, is the distance. Right. So you can explain what is uh, what? What is 24, what is 12, and what is 6? Um, you can ask my name. 4 mm is the distance from anterior lacrimal crust yeah. to the anterior uh, ethmoidal foramen. 12 so mm is the distance is from anterior ethmoidal foramen to the posterior ethmoidal foramen. And right. 6 mm is the distance from posterior ethmoidal foramen to the optic canine. Right, right. right. Good. I have a suggestion for the residents here as well. Uh, you know, when you look at this presentation, you probably feel that uh, this is something which doesn't really concern uh, when you are doing your 
comprehensive ophthalmology or doing your other disciplines like your retina or cornea. But you have to remember that, you know, trauma is an important part of our practice and we all have to be, you know, well equipped to deal with trauma at every level. You cannot say that, you know, I haven't really, I have done my fellowship in cornea, so I do not know how to deal with, uh, you know, facial trauma. So when it comes, someone comes to you with this kind of trauma, so important to understand the orbital in anatomy. So, uh, or not only for your exam, but also for your future practice, you have to understand the orbital anatomy in detail and remember that. Rajesh, um, we are addressing the postgraduates here. They are supposed to be comprehensive ophthalmologists. They should know each and every subject. Right. Sure. Rather, and they are doing fellowship in all the specialties at this moment of time. They cannot ignore any speciality. True. And for trauma, you know, as I said, that yeah, this is exactly, very vital. Exactly. Agreed. Basic anatomy and the applied anatomy, they should know. Yeah. So that uh, that comes in all specialities, subspecialities, yes, because yes. it's all combined. Like, so if I get a patient of uh, uh, trauma with crepitus, so I think there is a question for the residents, like, what would you suspect? And what is crepitus and uh, how do you diagnose it? Like, how do you elicit it? Anybody? Don't put anybody, ask Jyoti, him by name. Yeah. <laughs> anybody, please, nobody. Ask by name. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Jyoti. Okay. So, whenever Jyoti. there is care in the soft tissue, we feel the crepitus. And crepitus. This is okay. the subcutaneous emphysema is the term that we use. So, it's, a, it's water content along with the air content. Both air are content, there. right. So, in... Uh, conjunction with the orbit or the lids where would you get and what is the reason for that like what would you sus suspect in that have you encountered uh, any of the patients like till now have you seen have you seen like uh, capitis patient with having crepitus Oh, because many of times they miss it actually because there is a lot of edema is there, echinosis is there and we fail to just palpate it or press it just to see uh, like what is the consistency. So then we yes. miss out those crepitus because it's not visible outside and moreover yes. patient comes with the orbital uh, edema with the swelling and proposis. So we have to rule out and that's very easy to uh, diagnose also. Certain walls have been... Uh, deranged or fractured so i have come given a clue to you which wall of the orbit most commonly inferior inferior fractures which one is the thinnest medial wall is the thinnest so yes. in cases of medial wall fractures mostly it's the medial wall fracture okay so these are certain aspects which you know when you know the applied anatomy. And once you know the anatomy, you get those uh, uh, diagnosis differentials and you can just go into the confirmation of that. Because those have some uh, repercussion also if you are not telling the patient to take some precautions regarding that. So it may increase like if you have valsalva maneuver or something, then in this medial wall fractures, there is more of proptosis, there may be more of uh, compression in the orbit. Mm -hmm. So you have to know basically. Even the type of injury which you have, like a tennis ball injury or a injury which is blunt injury. So you may have a floor fracture. So how to diagnose it? So if you know about the anatomy well and the movements of the eyeball and the position of the eyeball, you are very well... Uh, Knowing without getting a CT scan done also that this may be the uh, diagnosis for this patient. What is a tripod fracture? Anyone? Ankita. Dr. Ankita. Ankita is a moderator, I think. I'm sorry. Uh, there are two Ankita. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is <laughs> another Ankita is there, no? 
<laughs> yes, sir. It's uh, maybe zygomatic or maxillary complex fractures. Tripod. Why is it called tripod? Tripod means it has to get severe uh, fracture. Uh, because. So, what are those three locations? One is one is this one. What is yes. that? Pronto. Pronto. Zygomatico. Okay. Zygomatico. Maxillary. Zygomatico maxillary. What is this part? Zygomatico temporal. I'll show it to you in another image. This part. What is this? You can palpate your own. Yes. What is it? The... Any kind of arch? Jago is arch. Yes. is there and it's arch. So that's the zygomatic. I arch. think the anatomy should be very clear for all of you, actually. Yeah. Yes. So, on which bone does Vitnal's tubercle lie? Zygomatic bone, sir. Right. So, if someone's zygoma is fractured and it's moved down, what finding will you see with the canthus? Where will the canthus be? The canthus will, be, will also move down. So, it is attached to the Vitnal tubercle. So zygoma fracture, why does it always move down? Why not up? Gravity can be one reason, but what's the other strong force that is attached to it? Which is, is the it because of the Lockwood leg suspensory ligament of the Lockwood? No, 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 no. I'm talking about there must be some strong muscle which is pulling down, which right? Which is the strongest muscle in the body? <laughs> Masseter. Yes. So masseter originates from the zygoma, right? And then gets inserted onto the mandible. So when this bone is broken in three places and it's free to move, that muscle will pull it downwards because of the downwards. And obviously inwards because the blow came from front. So that's why what will happen to the canthus? It will move down. So in your emergency, if you see someone whose canthus is not aligned with the other one, you know that this is not just orbital fracture, but this could be a zygoma fracture also. What are all the structures attached to the Vitnal's tubercle? It is the suspensory ligament of the Lockwood, uh, the lateral canthal tendon, and the lateral horn of the levator aponeurosis. Uh, and there's one more, ma'am. Mm. Lateral palpebral ligament. That's it, or no? Lateral canthal ligament. Also, the uh, capsular palpebral fascia, the, the lateral uh, condensation. Good. So similarly, like how this canthus would move down, if there's a fracture of the frontal process of maxilla, which canthus will move down? So when you have naso orbital ethmoidal fractures, they're also called NOE fractures, you will have medial canthal dystopia. It will again move down, downwards, because this whole piece has moved down and you have a dystopia. So just by looking at how soft tissue is displaced, you can kind of predict what kind of fracture this patient is likely to have when you do a CT on them. You shouldn't do the reverse, like look at the CT and then diagnose it, but try to look for clinical clues. They are pretty obvious. Even through the swelling, you can notice it. Any other questions, comments? Orbital blocks uh, in relation to this. Yeah. So blocks are given. 
external DCR, of the port. Uh -huh. which blocks are given uh, uh, in relation to all what for amends you can just explain to the residents uh, where the blocks are given. They are giving left and right. I think uh, they should be able to tell. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to be. <laughs> Yes, your yeah, inferolaterally you would be giving the peribulbar or which goes into the extra conal space. Yes. The same can be angulated towards the cone and that becomes intraconal. And nowadays, uh, many cataract surgeons use subtenance block. Uh, of course, topical is very common, but when you have to give a block, subtenance is entering into the subtenance space. So, three out of these four spaces you are already giving. Yes. Yeah blocks to operate on the eyeball per se. Supraorbital, infraorbital yes. blocks. Uh, the easier such. Yes, you have to study their surface marking landmark. How do you identify where is the infraorbital foramen to give the block? What are the transforal methods and the transcutaneous methods to block this nerve? So we block this nerve for any lower eyelid or malar uh, surgeries. So probital for any procedure on the forehead. Frontal nerve block for upper eyelid surgeries. Check the chat box if there's anything. Yeah, I don't think they have any questions, mm -hmm. no additional questions. <laughs> yeah, actually, it is very detailed uh, presentation, Milind. Uh, really, you. I'm very much interested, actually, to recap all my anatomical uh, knowledge, which I am having. Um, I think it is very interesting for the residents as well. Somehow, they are not coming up open. Only thing I want to tell all the residents are we are very, very open here and we want to accept any question from you people. It is a free classroom discussion without any hesitation. And uh, the speaker like here, Melinda is very, very uh, mastery in the orbital anatomy because he is the one who really suggested for a cadaver dissection. Right, Milit? In yeah. the very beginning days, no one thought of uh, bringing a head and <laughs> do all the uh, dissections. So he's very well versed with and he was given this topic so the, for very reason. So you people should clarify all your doubts in this uh, one and a half hour session and uh, then use maximum utilization. Okay. And next class will be on the lacrimal system. I'm telling you now only it is on 23rd of this month. Come prepared. Let us utilize the one and a half hour to the maximum. You should be very open to participate. Yes. The more you participate, it will be more interesting for everyone. Yeah, the speaker should be always questioned in between the talks. By the yeah, we should not accept his supremacy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is supreme, there? but we should not accept it. Then only it will be more interesting. Yes, it's an interactive session, so we should always. Any mistakes are questions. accepted. Any mistakes are accepted, no problem. Absolutely. See, everyone will have mistakes. We accept mistakes. Unless we do mistakes, we cannot learn it. As simple as that. So next time what we can do is we can have a simple questionnaire <laughs> at the start of the session. <laughs> at the end of the session? <laughs> and and then at the end of the session. Right. Like how about your lunch? Yes, yes. So I'm telling so how, the topic two weeks ahead of time now. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So they're they should be ready with the preparation. Yeah, and uh, let them read uh, for two three days. Absolutely. Okay. It is whole of the lacrimal system and the surgeries related to it. 
and all the evaluation investigations everything will be discussed and here we uh, are with the master actually this month the speaker oh. is speaker is a master so they should yeah, take yeah, advantage yeah. That's of that what we are we are calling the best possible speakers in yes. the subject so they there have is vast no and about it. experience yeah. knowledge and everything expertise so we should exploit them as much as possible the pg yes. students and residents we should utilize the, uh, their expertise absolutely absolutely so i think uh, it's time to close yeah. dr sabhasha ji are you there sabhasha ji time for dr bnr to speak i think yes i might to speak thank you once again as you know uh, dr milind once again he has given us a very very comprehensive picture of orbital anatomy and also applied aspects tell you thank you and thank please you, be you. with us once again in future sessions and of course our panelists today our moderators dr bigyan dr rajesh has given the best beautiful comments and i think uh, many times uh, uh, their comments are also very useful to the speaker and yes. uh, of course the panelists definitely they've done their job and um, only thing i was here not very much happy that uh, the the discussions were silent very much today last last program they really very much uh, i mean uh, um asking questions a lot of things but today i think somehow a little bit subdued so thank you again discussions please come prepared and uh, ask questions bombard questions to the speakers and panelists that's why there are a lot of panelists and the moderators to answer all your queries and of course last but not the least uh, uh, our uh, president elect dr jayant borua they are since uh, from the beginning of the session to and Thank you, Dr. Barbara sir. So Welcome. Nice Thank you, sir. And please do come with every every webinars. Please join with us. And uh, of course, our uh, mentor, uh, with, uh, he being a retina surgeon, sitting all throughout the orbit. It's definitely, it's really, you know. No, no. It will, uh, it will definitely improve my knowledge. Actually, <laughs> I brush all my subject all through life. <laughs> so that i can be a better human being it's quite refreshing so thank I, you very milit much. says in his, in his posture also <laughs> <laughs> right <Okay>. milit <laughs> yes thank you all viewers and the participants in this webinar thank you all it's really nice webinar. before i close i think i have asked mr rahul do you have a video to play yeah, our host rahul are you there who <laughs> be <laughs> mr uh, Rahul, okay. So I must right. thank the our host, Enter Pharmaceuticals, to provide the platform. And once again, we meet again on twenty third for uh, this month to continue our uh, webinars, Swartiyas so Isaac webinars. Thank you very much for all. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Milan. Thank you, Milan. Thank, thank, thank you, Milan. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Yeah, one more topic you need to take. I will inform you later on. Yeah, yeah. We'll definitely we'll ask him to watch again. <laughs> we have total seventeen topics in oculoplasty. So this is okay. the second one. Third one is lacrimal, yeah. lacrimal system and all lacrimal surgery is already fixed. Right. right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, Dr. Sir. Okay, bye. I think okay, why, why students are not opening up? Huh? Students are I not don't know. Up. See, I think we need to involve some of the seniors in the uh, medical college also so that they should because probably they have the inhibition. Still, we are unable to yeah, yeah, that's, that's break that reason. inhibition. That's it. That's right. Mm -hmm. So somehow we need to make this and uh, speaker time and again I am reminding the speakers actually to ask the questions. Yeah, in between they should ask questions. Correct. No, no, they are asking. Problem only problem is that they don't know the names of the students, right? Ah, yeah, yeah. I told them also. Uh, uh, becoming a difficult for them to name them. I think we'll, I will send, I will send a small paper forward. I, I will send a small paper of the discussion. Maybe the names of discuss discussion before the we start the session. Yeah, that will be very good. 
No, no, even the postgraduates, we should assure that nothing will be wrong. Yeah. Okay. They can Are ask they, any question. Yeah, that question that's so, that's, this that's, is a great chance for them to interact with the best of the best people in the country for any subject given. Actually, I'm calling the best persons that who are possible, actually. Maybe one more thing. They're not much exposed to octoplasty procedures. Does it matter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, octoplasty is the most, more chances they will get. Mm. Actually, as a resident, I have done more octoplasty pr procedures than any other specialty. <laughs> Sachi, I have done PKs also as a resident. Right. I don't know how many residents will do PKs. Uh -huh. Actually, I don't think they are much exposed to the orbital surgery. So today's topic is like specialized surgery. I don't think they should really change. Not at all specialized, madam. We can do uh, orbital surgeries. <laughs> that means uh, uh, taught me everything. <laughs> Sarvita, right? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think somehow we need to encourage them to ask the questions and speak more. They are not coming on the video also. That is another big problem. My video is off suddenly. I didn't realize it. But <laughs> my video, somebody is uh, stopping my video. I don't know who. Yeah, yeah. There, I, must, be I have tried. Yeah. <laughs> there must be some enemies for you, Bignya. <laughs> <laughs> that I have like yeah, I'm stop it. starting my video. Rahul, you can Rahul, Rahul, you can stop it. You can close it. Rahul, <laughs> Rahul you can close it. Yeah. So next is on twenty third January. Yeah. BNR. Oh, As okay. BNR right. dictates and I follow his orders. Are you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't speak. I, I didn't name the speaker. Mm. Otherwise, you will kill me. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, please stop it. Please stop it. Now you can close. Stop long ago. 